What's up guys? I'm Laura from Reading in Bed and today I'm here to talk to you about Behold the Dreamers by Mbolo Mbui. Now this book came into my life partially because I had a gift card to spend because this is a brand new hardcover and holy shit it cost almost $40. Um, but I had my eye on it because uh, for one thing I'd heard that this author was the first African-born author to get a one million dollar advance for a novel and I'd also heard that she was rather mysterious in that she had never published anything prior, not a short story, not an essay, nothing, and has no social media presence, so people are just like, who the heck is this person? Um, so, you know, the first thing I did was searched her here on YouTube, uh, you know, because I was trying to figure out how to pronounce her last name. Uh, and the first hit was her talking to a group of librarians and explaining her background, where she's from, how she came to get this novel published, even how she came to get this Jonathan Friends and blurb on the back. So it's all there. I mean, people just must not look on YouTube for this kind of thing, because that video was from May. So anyways, that's how I came to have this book in my life. And I also learned that the title was originally going to be The Longings of Jendi Jonga. Now, I'm glad they changed it because that's not a good title, but it sort of speaks to the story a bit. So um, Jendi Jonga is from Cameroon. He's an immigrant. He's living in New York City and driving a cab. Um, he was separated from his wife and child for a while, but he's brought them over. And the action kicks off when he gets a job as a private chauffeur to a very wealthy family, uh, the Edwards. So he is driving Clark Edwards around. Clark is an executive at Lehman Brothers. He has a wife named Cindy, who's a nutritionist and like a socialite, basically. They have a couple of kids. Um, so it's the story of these two families. Uh, it's set in New York City in 2008. Um, amid the Lehman Brothers scandal and the financial collapse that followed, and it just follows both these families in pursuing the American dream. And when we start, we've got the Clarks who are basically living that dream, and we have the uh, Jongas who are, are, you know, really struggling, but uh, they have that goal in mind. Um, so my rating for this book on Litzy, which if you're not on Litzy, you can only rate books three ways. A pick, a meh or a pen. Um, I initially went with a meh. Uh, there were some issues I had with the writing, but um, I found that since I finished a couple weeks ago, I'm still thinking about this book quite a lot. So it's quite likely that I'm going to upgrade the rating to a pick because, um, you know, if a book sticks with you, there's a reason for that. So I'm going to tell you about what's stuck with me and, uh, and then some of the issues I had. So firstly, this is a very timely story. So it's about the financial collapse of 2008. This seems to be almost a little subgenre because the, the Wangs Against the World also comes to mind. Um, and we've got the two families on very different sides of this financial scandal um, and the collapse, but it's, it doesn't unfold the way you would expect. Uh, it's not just about the evil corporate overlords and the poor, you know, downtrodden immigrants just trying to make their way. Like it, it is, but it isn't. Um, because on the one side we have the Edwards who are very wealthy, uh, but uh, Clark, who's the executive at Lehman Brothers, is very conflicted. He wants to do the right thing and he's really struggling with that. Now he's no saint, he's cheating on his wife with prostitutes and like all this other crazy stuff, um, and Cindy has her own issues. But, uh, but he's, you know, like he has a conscience, um, and you can see that it just doesn't really guide him the right way. And then uh, with the Jongas, with Jendi and uh, Nenny, they're not totally innocent either. I mean, they come from Cameroon, they don't want to go back, they didn't have the greatest life there, it was uh, their parents didn't want these two to get together, so um, they had a lot of issues back home with that. They're in New York and they want to stay. Uh, however, they're not really going about it that ethically. <laughs> I guess uh, Jendi and Nenny and their lawyer are kind of concocting the story that uh, if if they get shipped back to Cameroon, um, that Jendi is going to end up in prison, that all these things are going to happen, which like there's a tiny kernel of truth, but it's not true. Like, it's a lie. Um, and then Nenny is actually even uh, more ruthless than Jendi by far and more ambitious. So as the story goes on and it, it seems like they're going to have to go home because like Jendi's lost his visa, he doesn't have a work permit, um, he loses his job, various reasons. So she ends up blackmailing the Edwards because she's got dirt on them, right? Because as these families come together, they learn a lot about each other. Um, 
so so yeah it's not as black and white as you think like and you know the the jangas are not perfect by any means you want them to to win you want them to stay in the states but at, at the same time like they're doing some pretty crazy stuff um and uh and jendy uh beats nenny in one scene which is pretty controversial i've seen reviews that said like i just can't handle this story because of you know it's the misogyny and, and all of that um so so yeah like these are complex characters and no one's totally good and no one's totally evil um so there was that uh that side of the story where it wasn't all black and white i like that and there were two very common tropes that were sort of turned around as well one is this idea of um the magical negro so this is like in the help right where the the black housekeepers teach some important lessons to their white employers and you know that seems to be why they're there just to teach them the meaning of love or something ridiculous like that now it kind of goes that way at first where you know that i think that's why clark and cindy edwards um open up so much to jendy and to nenny they you know they see them as a very strong family unit and they want to know how they do that uh, but in the end, it's not that the Jongas help the Edwards. It's uh, that Jendi becomes very disillusioned after seeing what happens to the Edwards after, you know, the the financial collapse and the marital collapse and everything else. He's so disillusioned that like he basically gives up on his American dream. Um, and that leads to the other trope that gets upended here, which is the idea of immigrants coming to the States and sacrificing everything for their children, that they will give up their own hopes and dreams, that they will, you know, work all day and all night to make sure their kids can have the things they didn't have. And that's like, that happens in this story too. However, without spoiling too much, as I mentioned, Jendi does eventually decide that he's had enough. Um, that he is not going to sacrifice anymore. He's not going to give up his dignity uh, any longer. He makes a stand. Um, and that was pretty unexpected. And like I said, I won't get into how it happens, um, but it won't be what you expect, most likely. And uh, yeah, so those were two tropes that I was, you know, reading like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, but then they, uh, Mbui flipped them. And uh, I love that. Like all of those things I'm still thinking about weeks later and trying to figure out like, you know, what did this mean? What did that mean? Uh, how she sort of played with our expectations. It was really impressive. So the things that didn't work so well for me in this book, basically it's very uh, dialogue heavy, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I had trouble figuring out the motivations of some of the characters sometimes because of that. I didn't have a sense of their internal life. It was just all sort of um, like a lot of the book takes place in the car because Jendi's driving them around all day. And that's how he hears all these conversations and becomes uh, all tangled up in their lives. Um, so it was good. Like the dialogue was well written. It wasn't clunky. And I know that's hard to do. But sometimes I wish there was a little more of just another perspective or another way of narrating that would give me a bit more to go on. Because um, sometimes I just I didn't know like all these conversations in the car I'm like would they really have this conversation in front of their chauffeur like this uh I know it was 2008 and you maybe they didn't have smartphones so they can text but like wouldn't you just wait like would you really have this fight with your husband over the phone in the car with your chauffeur and I couldn't figure out if it was because they didn't see Jendi as a real person so they didn't care or if it was sort of almost a performance like they wanted him to uh to see this drama happening and you know step in or something I like I don't know um so there was something about that that didn't quite work for me however because of the other things I mentioned and that I'm still thinking about this book today I am going to upgrade it to a pick so you know if you heard anything that interested you I would urge you to go pick this up you might want to wait for the paperback it's $40 um and I'm a little biased too because that video I mentioned where Mbolo and Bowie is talking about her life and everything um, I found out that before becoming a famous writer, she was a market researcher. I'm a market researcher too. And that how she got this blurb from Jonathan Franzen is because The Corrections is one of her favorite books. So she decided to pursue or stalk, in her words, Jonathan Franzen's agent because that's who she wanted to be represented by. Well, I stalk Jonathan Franzen too online. It's not very effective since he's not online, but you know, I do it. So I think we could totally be friends. Um, so yeah, a little bias there perhaps. However, I'm going to call this a pick.
Go and get it. Behold the dreamers in Bolo and Bowie. Thanks for watching.